Um, hello, uh, welcome to all. Welcome back to those of you who have visited us pre uh, previously in this conference on uh, Foucault's Confessions, or at least entitled Foucault's Confessions. Um, as many of you know from the uh, advertisement of the conference, we are visiting uh, Foucault's engagement with late, uh, I'm sorry, early and in some respects medieval Christianity, almost entirely Catholic with uh, occasional references to his own occasional references to the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. Um, I would like to uh, thank, as always, the uh, Rockwell Foundation for its very, very generous support of this conference, uh, the Department of Religion at Rice for sponsoring the conference, and uh, for the Humanities Research Center at Rice for providing additional support. I would also just very rapidly like to thank this wonderful array of speakers that we have had so far. I will list them with uh, the intention of also letting those of you who don't already know that the recordings of almost all of their talks are now widely available, Nikki tells me, uh, on social media as well as on the website that she has created. Uh, so uh, in short, thanks to James Bernauer, to Peter Brown, to Philippe Chevalier, whose uh, talk I believe is not available, uh, to Mark Jordan, to Lynn Hoffer, to our own Nikki Clemens. Uh, to Elizabeth Clark, Ariana Sforzini, Daniela Lorenzini, um, and to the two speakers to follow. Um, our final speaker will be Ashil Membe. We are not entirely certain when the uh, talk will take place uh, because of his other obligations, but are very happy to have as our penultimate speaker. Martina Tazziolini. I did that wrong, didn't I? Tazzioli, sorry. <laughs> Italian is not one of my specialties. Um, the title of whose talk is If the Truth is Turned Against the Colonized, Exhaustive Verbalization, and the Impossibility of Truth Telling. Uh, Nikki, please uh, take over a proper introduction of Martina. Thank you so much, Jim, and uh, thank you once again to all of the speakers who have been contributing such extraordinary contributions week to week in a way that really shows the disciplinary range that we need to engage in order to be able to take up Foucault, his Les de la Chair, his Confessions of the Flesh, not only what the text is in itself, which is of course incomplete, but also what are some of the ethical questions that are raised for us. And today I'm so delighted to introduce Martina Tazzioli, who will be bringing us into this critical and constructive framing of how Foucault's work on confession allows us to think through particular crises today, notably in the construction of the subject of the asylum seeker or the refugee, and how this encodes a logic of the colonized that, uh, that Dr. Tazzioli will unfold through the work of Franz Fanon as well. Um, Martina is a uh, lecturer at Goldsmiths and has also been a professor at Swansea University, uh, city of London, and also postdocs at uh, La Bex and Aix-en-Provence. The work that Martina does is really vital, and it's a conjunction of uh, political theory, of uh, border studies, uh, of migration studies, uh, of political geographies, and the way in which there's a very global and a very contemporary focus is uh, really the, the peak way of thinking about what our own conference can help us think through with Foucault's tools, but also exceeding the limitations of his own particular episteme. Uh, Martina is also the author of many books now, monographs, most recently The Making of Migration, which is the biopolitics of mobility at Europe's borders from 2019-2020, uh, 
also Tunisia as a revolutionized space of migration in 2017, and Spaces of Governmentality in 2014. She's also been an editor for a series of volumes that uh, include some of our other speakers and is a part of the editorial collective of Radical Philosophy and a member of the Euro-African Network uh, Micro, you can pronounce it better. Uh, but I really am so pleased and delighted that you'll be able to be able to guide us through the use that we can actually put Foucault's own analytic to today and what this means for the politics of subjectivity for all. Please welcome Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikki, for the extremely generous um, introduction. And thank you, James and Nikki in general, for the, for the invitation to take part to this series. So um, as Nikki said, uh, today I'm going to speak about, I'm going to interrogate the concept of confession in light of a specific setting in which uh, confession is um, at stake, which is the politics of asylum. And this is because not only because it's a, a topical team uh, that I'm also doing research on, but also because this is uh, one of those uh, spaces and sites where individuals are constantly asked to, um, to engage in what Foucault calls exhaustive verbalization. And I will do this by uh, putting in dialogue Foucault and Fanon uh, analysis on confession and on this on the multiple injunctions to speak that subjects are exposed to. So the governing through truth is Foucault's explain one of the features of Western society. And in general, the Western man, he argues, has become a confessing animal. Confession, Foucault's point out in wrongdoing through telling, is a sort of engagement, but an engagement of a particular type. Indeed, it implies, I, I, I cite, that he who speaks promises to be what he affirms himself to be, precisely because he is just that. More precisely, confession implies a verbal act through which the subject affirms who he is, binds himself to this truth, places himself in a relationship of dependence with regard to another, and modifies at the same time his relationship to himself. So in this um, talk today, I interrogate how regime of veridiction, knowledge extraction process, and exhaustive verbalization have been differently intertwined in the colonial context and how they are played out nowadays in the field of asylum. So more precisely, I interrogate if in those contexts, the individuals who confess are expected to engage with what they say and ask whether we can actually speak of, of confession. So throughout the paper, I use uh, the expression of knowledge extraction to designate the heterogeneous practices of exhaustive verbalization that individuals are requested to engage in. So I, I rename right this uh, forced, um, uh, uh, forced uh, speech um, in terms of knowledge extraction in order to draw attention to the multiple interpolation that individuals, in this case asylum seekers, are targeted by, and to the power dynamics at stake, so to the asymmetries between those who interrogate, who ask, and those who are requested to speak, so in particular the asymmetry between humanitarian actors and uh, asylum seekers. And also because the notion of knowledge extraction, as I will show, um, allow, um, allow us to point to the central um, um, to the centrality of asylum seeker uh, speech in, uh, in the knowledge production of humanitarian agency and also um, the knowledge produced of that state produced about asylum seekers and migrants. So it's not just a lateral activity, but actually most of the um, NGO reports and humanitarian uh, agency reports about asylum seekers are based on uh, knowledge on this detailed information that are extracted from refugees, asking them to speak about their what I call life coping strategy. So what distinctively characterizes the modes of veridiction at play in the asylum regime is the forced verbalization requested to the asylum seekers in conjunction with their representation as deceitful subject, incapable and unwilling to tell the truth. What, as I will uh, I mean, I will speak more about this later. I call this humanitarian paradox. So basically, asylum seekers are constantly asked to speak, and not only in the moment when they need to uh, convince um, uh, the, the panel that interview them for, the, for assessing their asylum application about, I mean, that they are in need of protection, but also in many other uh, 
moments of their journeys. Uh, so in order to tease out this argument, they take into account Foucault's analysis on confession together with Fanon's consideration about the discrediting of the speech and the conduct of the colonized as a deceitful subject, as a liar. More precisely, asylum seekers are object, as I just said, of forced knowledge extraction uh, procedures. And sometimes these knowledge extraction procedures are actually, um, I, let's say, promoted as volunteering activities that migrants consent to take part to. So let me start with what I call the impossible confession, uh, what um, in, the, in the colonial context, um, explaining and engaging with Fanon's work on uh, confession, and then I will move on to engage more directly uh, with um, uh, the, the, the topic of uh, the, asylum, the politics of asylum. So how are through telling and knowledge extraction procedure articulated to each other in context where individuals are deemed to be deceitful and untruthful, so incapable and unwilling of telling the truth? So by asking this question, I'm not interested in testing the extent to which Foucault's analysis on confession and truth telling can be mobilized in other contexts, right? That the context that Foucault uh, studied and focused on. Rather, I interrogate how exhaustive verbalization and the injunction for the individuals to tell the truth are inflective in, di in different ways or are situated within specific regime of eradiction. In this respect, Mathieu Renaud has uh, rightly raised the question, can we speak of a colonial culture of confession? Asking this, he argued, doesn't involve scrutinizing confession in known Western cultures. It rather involves the center in the Western culture of confession depicted by Foucault by considering it from its outside, means engaging in the writing of a history of truth in the colonies. Here I concur with Renault's methodological approach and I try to push this uh, forward and further by exploring the extent to which we can speak of confession in the colonial context and subsequently which nexus between knowledge extraction, veridiction and truth telling is, the, is at play in the field of asylum and why this connection. The first one, is, as I just mentioned, because there is this kind of um, humanitarian paradox in the asylum politics, so there is this constant injunction for the asylum seekers to speak, even if um, they are constantly depicted as suspicious, as liar, right? Um, and secondly, because the politics of asylum, as many uh, critical migration scholars as, uh, have demonstrated, is underpinned by uh, colonial legacy, which partly informed also the relationship between um, modes of subjectivation and mechanism of truth telling. So I suggest that Fanon's reflection on the conducts of confession in North Africa and on the colonized as a deceitful subject enables excavating different articulation of knowledge extraction through telling and exhaustive verbalization. In the North African syndrome, Fanon illustrates the scene of a doctor who is confronted with a patient from North Africa, uh, whose pain cannot be clearly localized, nor the illness can be fully diagnosed. The patient de facto ignores and refuses to translate his pain into the nosological categories that the, the doctor uses. The colonizer insists that his pain is everywhere. It cannot be circumscribed in a specific organ. He also refused to report the periodicity of his symptoms. I quote, this conformity to the categories of time is something to which the North Africa seems to be hostile. The spatial and temporal vagueness of the symptoms of the colonized subject makes him partially ungraspable by the nosological and medical categories. Yet, if the syndrome of the colonized subject is partially indefinable, right, this cannot be easily turned to his advantage. To the contrary, Fanon highlights that the colonized is actually portrayed as a liar, as a suspicious. The North Africa is a simulator, is a liar, is a slugger. Thus the partial uh, lack of classification is turned against the colonizer himself in this specific um, um, moment that Fanon describes, who in fact is not expected nor asked to tell the truth about himself. Rather, he needs to fit into what Fanon calls a pre-existing framework for by a dog categories forged by doctor for classifying, pathologizing, and discrediting the colonized subject. If the standard nosological apparatus does not work, this is because of the colonized patient's fault. The doctors will find the patients at fault and indocile and disciplined patients who doesn't know the rules of the game, end of quote. 
So hence, while the ordinary medical classification doesn't work, this is a tangible effect on the subjectivity of the colonized. Indeed, it does not merely appear as inadequate or non-compliant. It's also depicted as actively undisciplined and guilty. The North African, uh, Fanon argues, take his place in this asymptomatic syndrome and is actually put down as a discipline in terms of medical discipline inconsequential with reference to the law according to which every symptom implies a lesion and insincere, he says, is suffering when, uh, when we know that there are no reasons for suffering. So by saying that, Fanon highlights instances of what Gibson and Beneduce defines as of epistemological subjugation that individuals from former colonies are targeted by. So however, I suggest that so this irreducible in unintelligibility stems more precisely from the fact that the conducts of the North Africans, what uh, Fanon himself defined, the North, North African subjects have been racialized and thus from the colonial legacies that um, still shapes uh, um, the, the way in which people from former colonies are depicted. Indeed, uh, there is no space as a truthful subject for the North African in the regime of truth of the former colonel. So as I will show um, um, in the next section on the, on the asylum seekers, a similar epistemological subjugation based on racializing mechanism is at play in the field of asylum. So that all in part concern um, the level of knowledge as such, right? But is how this knowledge is uh, constantly, repeatedly, and historically inflected by this racializing mechanism. It's not just an intelligibility that um, concern uh, the lack of um, communication between the two parts. Um, so the colonizer is posited as incapable of telling the truth, and as an individual with discourse is ultimately irrelevant for the purpose of racializing and classifying it. Irrespective of what he says, the behavior of the colonized is diagnosed through a pre-existing set of racialized categories, which fix him to specific spatial temporal coordinates. So following Fanon in the colony, the practice of confession emerges partly disjoined uh, from the cast for truth. As long as the colonized is not expected to tell the truth about himself, nor is he considered reliable or capable to do so. So, uh, and yet at the same time, the colonizer is repeatedly interpolated and asked to speak. So in, in this sense, we can say that the colonizer is entrapped into an exhaustive verbalization without the possibility of telling the truth, without the possibility of uh, confession, um, or better is asked to confess as also Fanon um, uh, reporting someone is writing um, uh, this psychiatric writing, but at the same time, uh, as Fanon himself stress, uh, his confessional acts appears as impossible. Um, <clears throat> so in this sense, I think that if we take into account uh, this peculiar uh, articulation of the injunction to speak on the one hand and the impossibility for the colonizer, for the colonized, sorry, of truth telling, is possible to uh, look at this specific intertwine through the, through the lenses of knowledge extraction and extractive mechanism. <clears throat> so of course, if on the one side, the colonizer is crafted as a deceitful subject, and so is not expected to engage in truth telling, on the other, the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized is constantly framed, uh, Fanon reminds us, by specific regime of veridiction. In other words, the parcel disjoining between the injunction to speak and the injunction to tell the truth should not lead us to conclude that truth telling and truth production do not play and did not play a role, a role in the power dynamic between the former colonized and uh, the European or between the colonized and the colonizer. To the contrary, the pathologization of the colonized subject is sustained by a specific relation between power, truth and knowledge. Not only the regime of veridiction in the colony obfuscates and erase the historical violence of colonization. It also actively introduced racialized categories apt at classifying and criminalizing the colonized subject. So more than tying the subject to what he affirms, the injunction for the colonized to speak contributes to the non-subjectivity of the colonized. In context of confession in North Africa, Fanon foregrounds the impossibility of a full confession in the colony and at once the refusal of the colonized subject to confess. So this 
two uh, aspects, right? On the, on the one hand, the impossibility for even for uh, those subjects who want to confess to be recognized um, uh, um, by, by the community. Uh, and on the other, the resistance and the refusal on the part of the colonized to confess. So the impossibility and failure of confession in the colony relies on the fact that, I quote, the criminal's reintegration via the confession of his act depends upon the recognition of the group by the individual. In other words, the social function of confession is preventively occluded and hampered by the lack of recognition by a pre-established community of the colonized as a political subject and as a subject who belong to that community. In turn, the colonized actively resist confession or also silently sometimes. And by doing so, he refuses, I quote, to authenticate by confessing his act, the social contract proposed to him. And this means that his profound submission to the power that be cannot be confounded with an acceptance of his power. So the conduct of the colonized with respect to confession is fundamentally ambivalent. So he both engage in what Fanon defines as the orchestration of the lie, and he constantly withdraws from confession at large. So if we go back to uh, what Foucault's arguing around doing through telling, in the judicial fields, uh, confession plays the role of linking up the criminal act to its author. That is the criminal subjectivity emerged in the 19th century, Foucault's explained as a result of practices of confession in the judicial institutions. The truth telling of criminal subjectivity and the knowledge about the criminal anticipate the judgment about the criminal act. So in other words, is the link between the criminal act, the author and the confessional discourse, which is at the core of contemporary judicial practice. However, as Fanon stressed in conducts of confession in North Africa, such a link presupposes that the individual who is asked to confess, recognize his own act as well as the judicial procedure. Indeed, what characterized the colonial context is precisely the lack, the lack of a mutual recognition between the colonized and the colonizer, and also between the judge and the person accused of committing a crime. So indeed, he argues that to recognize uh, an act before judges is already to, to, allow, to confess that one disapproves it. However, justice cannot intervene unless the act has been recognized by the accused. So, um, this is the reason why, uh, according to Fanon, the Algerian Arab does not try to prove his innocence. He claims his innocence. That is, he disengages and withdraws at the same time from the regime of truth he's asked to participate and endorse. So for this reason, there is no appropriation, he argues, of the act by the defendant. The act now appears to be without a perpetrator and a criminological understanding proves to be impossible. So I think that this is also really at the core of uh, this, this, this um, tension, these dynamics between the impossibility of recognizing the subject as a subject to confess, and at the same time, how the colonized or the subject from coming from former colonies um, are, are also resist in turn confession uh, is really at the core of final analysis and, and, and is one of the most interesting, most interesting point to um, uh, put in dialogue Fanon uh, reflection on um, this, uh, this force exhaustive verbalization with what is going on also in the field of asylum. Um, <clears throat> as Fanon remarks in the wretch of the earth for the native objectivity is always directed against him. Objectivity is in fact, both instrument of racialized classification and vehicle of reification and alienation. In a similar vein, also truth is constantly turned against the colonized. And insofar as his conduct is interpreted and classified through the, the diagnostic categories, which craft him as an undisciplined subject and as a liar. <clears throat> Following Fanon, the colonized subject constantly clashes with the truth of the colonizer, which is credited and nullifies the truth telling uh, of, of the colonizer, of the colonizer himself. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think that this level of uh, confrontation between the colonized and the colonizer um, is one of the multiple layers in which this uh, tension between, um, uh, in, in terms of uh, conflicts in, at the level of uh, truth telling takes place. But then Fanon also um, uh, speak about a collective uh, dimension in which truth telling is at stake um, <clears throat> in the colony, 
and um, and this and and this level, uh, this layer concern um, the the kind of counter truth that the Algerian people, uh, according to Fanon, was able to mobilize, to enact, uh, at, and uh, to put in place against uh, what was presented as the truth of the colonizers. So there is this uh, level that to me that, um, that um, uh, is quite interesting to bear in mind uh, when I will speak in a minute about um, the context of migration to consider different possibilities and also this possibility of, a, of enacting a collective counter truth against uh, the truth of, of colonialism um, that, is, that open up possibility, right? Without uh, narrowing down uh, our analysis of, um, of this nexus between truth telling and mode of subjectivation to this specific uh, individual confrontation between the colonizer and the colonized. So, uh, Having all this in mind, um, I now move on to speak about um, what, what, hap what happens in the so-called field of asylum, right? Um, and as I said, uh, well, just to um, reiterate this point, uh, the reason why uh, this uh, insight into asylum politics is relevant for the purpose of, let's say, this uh, series, right, on confession and, and Foucault, is because is um, in, in the moment when uh, individuals decide to lodge an asylum application, uh, they are they start to be targeted by this injunction to speak, and of course the most emblematic moment is when asylum seekers are confronted, need to deal with this this panel of people um, uh, who interview uh, the asylum seeker, asking asking them to, uh, to, to justify, to support their application, their asylum uh, claim in order to prove that they really need uh, um, to, uh, to get the refugee status. But uh, before and after that, there are also many other moments and spaces where people who seek asylum and migrants at large are requested uh, to speak, um, despite they are constantly um, depicted and treated as liars and suspicious. So uh, state authorities, humanitarian actors, and international organization interpolate asylum seekers for diverse reasons, which include deciding on their asylum claims, collecting data for statistical purposes, for profiling the refugee, refugee population, and generating what the European agency Frontex call risk analysis. Right? And in particular, it seems to me that over the last few years, there has been really um, uh, uh, a focus on uh, knowledge extracted from asylum seekers and migrants as a, a, syst a, a systematic way of collecting information, different heterogeneous kind of information, not only biometric data, right? But also information about migrants' life coping strategies in order to generate knowledge about them and to spy on their roots, on their tactics, on their modes of resistance, and in, in order to uh, shift and to reinvent new modes of capture, new modes of control. Um, so and in, I'm saying this by, I mean, I mean building on my um, uh, research, um, that is that focus on uh, on the Mediterranean region and and in this moment in particular on the northern shore of the Mediterranean of, of the Mediterranean region, so southern Europe. Uh, although these mechanisms I mean are at play uh, everywhere, but it's good I think to give a bit of like context. So um, for those who are not familiar uh, with the topic, uh, when migrants uh, land, so they arrive um, uh, by boat, right? Um, uh, to Europe, they are um, they are fingerprinted. Um, there is this um, obligation for the states to fingerprint uh, migrants or to take their digital trace, right? Um, uh, as soon as migrants enter the, the, the European territory, and to send this fingerprint um, to a European database called Eurodac. Um, and this allows um, European um, authorities, I mean, uh, national authorities, sorry, to share this biometric data um, with the police of other states in order to check um, um, if 
this, if a person has already been in Europe and if this person has already been um, in another European countries before that, um, in order to enforce uh, the Dublin regulation, this uh, EU regulation that established that as, um, people who seek asylum can lodge an asylum application only in one European countries and only in the first European country they enter and simplifying, but this is in a nutshell what this regulation argues. So this is the main reason why they are fingerprinted. But um, so, and there is a huge literature in migration studies that explains how indeed this centrality of biometric technologies and the biometric principle according to which the body does not lie, right? So that you can, irrespective of what you say, of your speech, of your confession, to put in focus, uh, your body tells to the power where you are and where you have been in the past um, through this biometric collection. Despite this, migrants are constantly asked to provide a supplement to, uh, to, to speak um, for multiple reasons, as I said. And it, to me, it's important to account for this heterogeneity. It's not just to speak about where they come from. It's not only to speak about in order to prove that they need international protection, but for multiple reasons I said, also to generate roots, uh, sorry, knowledge about their roots, their tactics, and not only uh, in terms of, in order to um, enact an individual hold over the migrants, right? But sometimes just to collect data that in a, in, a, in a second step are anonymized and are used by European and national authorities to produce uh, risk analysis statistics and report, right? So sometimes it's not only the knowledge about the individual migrants. Um, so um, <clears throat> more precisely, asylum seekers are incessantly asked to speak while they're often and actually most of the time deemed to be the seedful subject. That is their object of knowledge extraction process. And at the same time, both their speech and their conducts are considered fraudulent and unreliable. So it's not only the level of their speech, but as also Fanon stresses, also how they behave. Um, so far from being in opposition to each other, the repeated interpolation of asylum seekers and their representation as subject incapable and willing of telling the truth are mutually intertwined in the daily practices of refugee governance. So it's precisely the conjunction of knowledge extraction from asylum seekers and their depiction as the secret subject, which I suggest is worth investigating in light of both Fanon and Foucault, uh, consideration about through telling confession and subjectivation. So in a similar manner to the power dynamics that Fanon describes about the relationship between the patients and the doctor, asylum seekers cannot add credibility to their conducts nor to their speech. And these emerge in, part, I mean, in particular blatant way at the moment, in the moment when they are asked to defend themselves and to prove uh, that they need uh, the refugee status. So yeah, I'm interested in taking into account three moments. I mean, we can, I can add more, right? But just to give an example of this heterogeneity of extraction process that um, migrants uh, go through, right? I would say, I mean, as I said, I mainly um, uh, work on um, uh, Europe, but this is not something that happens in Europe only. And actually, even if we follow uh, migrant routes towards Europe, this knowledge extraction procedure happens even um, before along their journey. Uh, so international organizations such as IOM are in charge of collecting information and data um, um, from migrants uh, um, who are stranded or in transit or uh, return to countries such as uh, Niger. So I will focus on briefly on asylum interviews data extraction at the borders and what I call asylum seekers voluntary activities in refugee camps. So regarding asylum interviews, there is um, it's probably one of the moment that um, critical migration scholars and refugee scholars have explored the most, right, in terms of practices of exhaustive verbalization. Um, so as as scholars have pointed out, asylum seekers discourse are systematically considered by this panel, right, and interview them. Um, not, not credible, inconsistent, or contradictory. 
Roberto Beneduce has introduced the concept of moral economy of untruth to highlight that asylum seekers are forced to lie in order to match the categories of asylum and to be recognized as refugees. In particular, the notion of credibility as a quasi-legal category is widely used in refugee status determination as um, what Barbara Sorgoni defined a flexible device and uh, in order to reject asylum application. So as uh, Sorgoni described um, and retrace um, this, the centrality of the notion of credibility to, this, to reject asylum seekers application trace back to the late 90s, more precisely 1998, when the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees stressed, she argues the importance of oral testimony as evidence, especially when, as is often the case with asylum, claimants do not possess other types of material evidence attesting to their identities and their stories of persecution. So credibility is assessed by the asylum, by these panels, not only on the basis of internal coherence, right? Of, so on the basis of the asylum seeker story, what asylum seekers says uh, about um, um, themselves, ourselves, not only on the consistency between the asylum seeker speech and external evidence of his of their potential, I mean, of their being in danger or being persecuted, but also in light uh, of uh, the counter of origin information. So the counter of origin information consists in um, uh, data and uh, uh, information about the countries where asylum seekers come from, and that should be used among other criteria for evaluating the asylum claims for each applicant, of each applicant. Nevertheless, uh, country of origin information is the object of a contested debate between refugee support networks, international organization and states due to the opacity of the criteria used for assessing the safety and danger in each country. So of course, it's also is a political definition how these countries are classified. This, what counts as credible in the story of an asylum applicant depends on a combination of external evidence and internal coherence and is not circumscribed to the exhaustive verbalization of the asylum seekers, that is to their reconstruction of their story and journey. Um, actually, this, um, the, 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 the credibility of, of asylum uh, seekers' applications, so that is not, as I said, limited to their speech, is also uh, geographically inflected and um, through, uh, for instance, I want to um, uh, speak about uh, specific case studies, but I think is, is quite useful. So for instance, um, the so-called accelerated asylum procedure shows how the different, that is, uh, that is used uh, in many countries in Europe, show how the different geography of a person seeking asylum are intertwined and used by states for assessing and rejecting asylum application. According to the, U, the EU Asylum Procedure Directive, member states can use the accelerated procedure, I quote, in well-defined circumstances where an application is likely to be unfounded or, or where there are serious national security or public order concerns. However, um, the concept of unfounded application is subjected to an arbitrary and opaque scrutiny that member states might interpret in different way and as lawyers and NGO as denounced, mainly concern the asylum seekers country of origin. So in Italy, the accelerated asylum procedure, which was introduced for the first time in 2018, can be used any time that migrants, I quote, lodge an asylum application at the border or in transit zones after being apprehended by the police for dodging border controls or that they are detained for identification purposes. Therefore, two geographical criteria intersect and are mobilized preventive, to preventively deny the access to the asylum procedure. So this, it's not even uh, for rejecting asylum application. It, it comes before that, right? To prevent the admissibility to the asylum procedure. So asylum seekers country of origin and their geography of unruly mobility, that is the place where they've been found, right? Uh, by the police as illegalized migrants uh, concur in determining uh, their inadmissibility and ultimately rejecting their asylum application. So from here, I. Um, I suggest to, so this is the, as I said, the most emblematic moment and also the most critical moment because of course, this is what is at stake, right? People who seek asylum, the critical moment is when they are waiting if their asylum claim is accepted or not. Um, however, if we also broaden the focus 
from this moment uh, to other uh, sites and moments when they are uh, that uh, that asylum seekers uh, go through um, and take into account uh, the multiplicity of the techno bureaucratic and legal steps that they need to um, engage with. Uh, I think we find also other other uh, forms of knowledge extraction that is important again to take into account in order to highlight this heterogeneity. So data extraction at the border, as I said, uh, definitely biometrics is um, is a key um, uh, mom is a key technology also for sidestepping uh, asylum seekers and migrants' um, uh, speech and um, irrespective of what they say. Uh, we can uh, track where they are and where they have been in the past. So there is this partial uh, irrelevance, right, at the first glance of uh, migrant speech. But actually, if we look at what happens after the migrants disembark, for instance, in countries such as Italy, Spain, or, or Greece, um, the first, the first um, officers, the first human beings that they encounter are um, uh, officers from the European agency Frontex. So Frontex agency um, conducts what the agency itself conduct, calls the briefing activities in many arbors, in many Southern European arbors. It is worth noticing that the briefing activities are defined by Frontex, I quote, as the systematic extraction of, of information for intelligence purposes for migrants willing to cooperate, end of quote. So the briefing activities consist of a series of questions asked to the migrants and concern their life coping strategies, the logistics of their journey, for instance, how much they paid, which smuggling networks they used, and why they came to Europe. So the data, collect, the data collected is then anonymized and used as material for producing Frontex risk analysis. So every, every few months, Frontex generate this risk analysis that doesn't show so the, 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 any, any image right, of migration. There is this uh, production of abstract migration uh, uh, routes. Um, so in this case, data extraction activity is not used for identifying or knowing migrants on an individual basis because the fingerprint uh, operation um, is used for that purpose. And also, for instance, when asylum seekers lodge an asylum application, this is where this individual hold um, on, my, on migrants take place, right, for instance. So the relationship in this case between power and discourse is not an individualizing one. Rather, the data collected is processed for generating what I call abstract multiplicity. Uh, mass migrants are not expected to confess nor to engage with what they say. Um, more than on direct coercion, knowledge extraction activities are predicated in this moment on pushing, encouraging migrants to answer and playing on their fear of the potential negative consequences in case they refuse to speak. So what happens is that in principle, they are not obliged to answer this question, right? But they are invited to, and you can imagine in this moment of extreme, well, fear, but also vulnerability, um, Frontex asks them also to, for instance, provide their, uh, their, con their social media contacts, right? Their Facebook, their Twitter. In principle, they are not obliged to, um, and, interviewing front, well, they, they, they are aware that some migrants give the fake Facebook contact, but still some out of 100, there are always few hundred, few, few dozen of people who give the correct one, right? Um, and what matters for them to investigate on their profiles. Um, so uh, migrants are in this specific context are not expected to tell something which might reveal who they are, uh, of course, if migrants do not tell the truth, as for instance, they provide fake information about the smuggling uh, networks they use or about their routes, this might have an, an impact on Frontex knowledge production. And yet it's important to notice that during these debriefing activities, migrants are asked a series of pre-established questions. And also their answer is kind of channeled, right? Um, by the officers. Um, so uh, even whether or not migrants tell the truth, their responses are framed and included as part of pre-existing analytical frameworks and are used for supporting, supporting and strengthening Frontex narrative about migrants, migration trend and migrant invasion, right? Now, um, moving on to the third moment, which is uh, what I call refugees voluntary activities. 
so a, a diff very different way of extracting knowledge. Uh, so after disembarking, migrants are, uh, as I said, approached by these actors and also by others, by other agencies, and then they are fingerprinted, and then they are allowed, in principle, if they want, to claim asylum, and the asylum procedure starts. In some cases, their asylum application is um, preventively denied, right? If there's an inadmissibility procedure starts. But then what happens after, right? So if they, when they are taken to um, so-called hosting centers or hotspots or refugee camps. So even there uh, and before they wait, right? To be in, um, interviewed uh, uh, regarding their asylum claim, um, asylum seekers are also repeatedly uh, um, interpolated and targeted by knowledge extraction process. So I speak of voluntary activities, uh, putting voluntary in inverted commas precisely to um, stress uh, the ambivalence of this term, right? What does it mean to, um, to consent, to, uh, to, to, to accept to do this kind of voluntary activities when you're entrapped uh, in this extremely asymmetrical condition of being dependent on humanitarian actors that also judge and state actors that also judge your asylum application uh, when you don't know what might happen if you don't accept to take part in these activities. So humanitarian agency and international organization like the UNHCR interpolate asylum seekers and ask them, for instance, to participate in surveys, focus group and interviews. And through these activities in which migrants are asked to actively participate, right? So they need to take part, um, uh, they need, they are pushed, to, they are encouraged to take part to this activity as a humanitarian organization extract detailed information and data from them. So asylum seekers are nudged and encouraged to participate in the name of their own good. So as a possibility for them to improve their situation, but also to improve the refugee system at large. So there is this economy of the promise, right? Which is at stake that however is very, uh, again, ambivalent because they, they know they are aware that they don't receive anything back, but what might happen if they don't participate? And this is what in a research that I'm currently, um, in a project that I'm currently uh, conducting, I call participatory detention. So the fact that asylum seekers are not obliged, are, are entrapped in this uh, uh, ambivalent um, situation where consent, coercion, and willingness are extremely blurred and, and in which they are asked to participate to design solution uh, that improve their own confinement, their own uh, containment, right, in camp. Um, so, and this happened in particular in spaces such as Greece where migrant asylum seekers are given, for instance, um, some form of financial support. This happened also in other countries, but in Greece they received this form of financial support on uh, debit cards. And after receiving these debit cards that are paid by the European Commission, they are also asked to participate in surveys and focus group in which they are asked extremely detailed question about their life coping strategies, how they cope with their own strandness, right? But also how they use the money and the kind of activities they might engage in in the so-called black economy to cope with the situation. So overall, asylum seekers are targeted by what I call the humanitarian paradox. On the one hand, they are asked uh, and expected to speak in, multi in different ways, right? About different aspects of their journeys. And on the other, they are treated as deceitful subject and are depicted as uh, constantly suspicious. Um, so the exhaustive verbalization that as asylum seekers engage in is partly disjoint from confession, considered a discourse through which the subject ties himself to what he says. So in this regard is worth highlighting two points. First, in a similar vein to what Fanon contends about the colonized subject is not only asylum seeker speech, but also the conducts which is discredited as fundamentally untrue and consent, constant, constitutively um, suspicious. Secondly, the fact that asylum seekers are crafted as deceitful make it impossible for them to add any credibility to their conducts and discourse. Um, so, in this sense, there is also this impossibility of confession in light of what Fanon says, right? That confession, this impossibility to uh, 
be part and to validate the social contract. Um, so um, the regime of truth that asylum seekers are targeted by craft them as a, re a reliable subject in a twofold manner, as individuals whose discourses are deceitful uh, and, in, and are not recognized by the community and as subject to in turn try to constantly withdraw and um, uh, dodge uh, the system. In fact, confession, as Foucault remarks as well, constitute a sort of contract of truth and thus require that such a contract is recognized and signed by both parties. So um, I'm going towards the conclusion, the exhaustive verbalization that people seek, seeking asylum are exposed to at different steps of their journey should be, can be analyzed as key political technology of migration governmentality. And it's important to um, stress this uh, repeated uh, racialization that despite the differences, right, of these heterogeneous forms of uh, knowledge extraction is constantly, uh, is constantly a stake. And racialization change over time, right? So categories of like for excluding migrants change over time. Sometimes are people from some nationalities, some people are uh, sometimes are uh, migrants from other countries, depending also on how the geopolitical and political um, condition uh, shifts uh, in Europe and, and beyond. So uh, to conclude, by conceptualizing the obligation for asylum seekers to speak in terms of knowledge extraction, I pointed to the specific nexus between truth telling, exhausting verbalization and production of subjectivity at stake in the asylum regime. In particular, in the field of asylum, individuals are repeatedly interpolated and asked to speak and at the same time uh, portrayed as suspicious. Um, so uh, the exhaustive verbalization of asylum seekers takes place within an economy of discursivity in which they are crafted as incapable and unwilling to tell the truth. The genealogy of impossible confession and of knowledge extraction without retelling trace back as a demonstrated to the colonial time. The racialization of the colonized as a deceitful subject who resists the diagnostic gaze reverberates into the present in the widespread discrediting and preventing illegalization of asylum seekers. Knowledge extraction process often entail practices of exhaustive verbalization that however are partial, partially disjoined from the obligation of truth telling. And of course, um, this is um, because as both Fanon um, and Foucault clearly allied, the relationship between exhaustive verbalization and truth telling is, not, is never only an epistemic matter. Rather to be a stake is also the production of refugee subjectivity as repeatedly uh, racialized, right? Of course, we should not trace straightforward continuities between the colonial context and the present illegalization of people seeking asylum. And it's important also to bear in mind the specificity of the politics of asylum. So the fact that individuals who seek asylum in, would to be at stake is, um, is, a, is mainly their asylum application, right? So the, the, the struggle to obtain a specific legal status and the fact that they are targeted by knowledge extraction process Qua asylum applicant. Nevertheless, I think there are partially continuities, uh, as I demonstrated, uh, that can be uh, traced. Knowledge extraction procedures are not always oriented at turning individuals into confessing animals. Yet, um, and this, I mean, uh, building on um, what uh, Daniel Lorenzini argued last week, that I found a particularly uh, inspiring point. Um, this insight into the multiple knowledge extraction process um, can be, I think, can should not be um, narrowed to, an, to an analysis of the moments of subjugation that asylum seekers experience, um, and to this uh, aspect, to this dimension of extractive, the extractive mechanism of knowledge production. So, as um, Daniele Lorenzini suggested and pointed to uh, the last week, I am. Um, I think, I mean, um, I, I'd also think that it's important to envisage a um, possible moment of truth telling in which uh, we can counter this, um, what I call this extractive uh, power operation. And for me, having in mind uh, the specific context of asylum, uh, this concern both academic, what does it mean to engage in practices of knowledge production that are non-extractive um, and at the same time 
how to look, to draw attention to uh, truth telling practices that migrants themselves enact um, in different moments. In fact, both Foucault and Fanon's reflection on confession might be seen as an invitation to account for modes of truth telling which are not instructive and which lead to desubjugating practices. And as I said, this concern, both in my opinion, our um, um, ability of listening and watching at what migrants themselves have been doing and also in thinking, reflecting on how this um, knowledge extraction procedure are at stake in um, academic um, uh, knowledge production about refugees. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. It's uh, chilling and uh, I think so elegant in the construction of the argument, which really exposes the nefariousness of the logic that uh, is, is really relevant today uh, you know, with very concrete examples, uh, the, the ways in which even over the last month, the, the thousands of um, asylum seekers who have uh, landed in Italy, who are coming um, from, uh, from Libya, from various places, including Sub-Saharan Africa, Syria, and more. And I'm also thinking about the, the, the refugees who you know, died in the same passage and how this particular passage um, you know, off the coast of, uh, of Tunisia has uh, led to the, the deaths of so many. So thinking about your reflections today, two images from Foucault are really coming to mind. On the one hand, the history of madness, uh, Stoti Farinawi's The Ship of Fools and the logic of exclusion and the idea that you create the rationality of your society on the basis of who you're excluding. And um, on the other hand, the example of Dr. Lure and the water torture, where it's Dr. Lure in 19th century um, psychiatrist who is trying to get this person to confess that he's mad, right, Mr. A. And Mr. A says, uh, no, I'm not mad. There are people who are persecuting me. And he gets doused with, uh, with a cold water um, shower. So through this encounter of torture, Mr. A is eventually incited to confess the truth according to the will of Dr. Nukai. And so the, the, the two different images here of the ship of fools who are excluded from society um, and the incident of water torture, which shows how the forces of normalization operate Right, the means by which one gets to become a subject of a certain regime of truth is through that verbal confession. But in your description of the asylum seekers, it's like, who gets to land? Who gets to tell this truth? Who gets to then be seen as a reliable interlocutor, not on the basis even of who they are and their truth, but the truth of the conditions, right, of their country of origin, of the truth of those dangers and persecution. And in what way can we really think about this logic when it's in the best interests of so many of the countries who are you know, the, the sites for the landings, like the United States, and the complicity that we have in creating the geopolitical conditions that have led to this crisis in the first place. So there's both that way in which the subjectivity of the asylum seeker and the way you're describing it is, um, is an impossibility according to the colonized logic, but it's also seeming to be one of those ways in which the logic of the asylum seeker cannot be seen because of the very conditions that they are both trying to tell the truth of and denounce as not them because they are seeking asylum in this country, right? A possibility and are subjecting themselves accordingly. So I don't even really have a question. It's just that your, your talk was so fascinating and it seems like these, these dynamics are so, uh, vital for thinking through the ethics today. And I'm gonna do the, the, the annoying moderator thing and just ask you what you think of that. What do I think? Uh, in, uh, well, as you say, yeah, I agree that there is a problem. Uh, there is this active uh, containment. It's not that just migrants are um, not only left to die, but they are, uh, actively uh, pushed to that and amper from reaching, as you said, uh, the US and Europe. So the, the possibility, as you said, of like uh, showing up as an asylum seeker in Europe is, is really like a second step, right? 
and um, and so the, but of course these moments of knowledge extraction that I spoke about as I said are not narrowed to Europe this is very important so that in Europe there are specific institutions and laws that um, also channels and uh, structure these moments of knowledge extraction also in light of this common EU procedure like for instance the Dublin regulation um, but but this there are many migrants who claim asylum in non-European countries and in non-Western countries and who are uh, confronted with this agency like the, the International Organization for Migration and the UNHCR elsewhere. So I think it's interesting to see how these practices of knowledge extraction have been, there, is this, there has been this systematization uh, across the globe. Um, and and there are, and, and I agree with you that the, that we need to, uh, on the one hand, to look at um, how migrants are preventively hampered from reaching a Western country, um, and on, so also from uh, becoming visible in all these mechanisms that I just uh, highlighted, and on the other, however, uh, the fact that they are they are subjected to these also elsewhere. Thank you so much. Um, Daniele, I unmuted you if you'd like to ask your question out loud. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, hi, Marcina. <laughs> it's very nice to, to see you. Um, thanks so much for the talk. Um, we constantly talk about these things. Uh, so, so perhaps my question doesn't come as a surprise to you, but uh, um, I, I wondered if, if you could say something more about this notion of the deceitful subject, in particular in relation to what Foucault says about confession, because it seems to me that in Les Avaux de la Chère and when Foucault talks about Christian confession, there's this idea that uh, the subject is in a way deceitful, but it's also deceit. I mean, it's it's there's 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 a power in the subject herself or himself that actually uh, prevents the subject to reach the truth. And confession is something that helps, that should that that, that is supposed to help the subject herself to reach a certain truth. Whereas it seems that in the colonial context that Fanon talks about. And in the more contemporary context that you talk about with asylum seekers, um, the elements, I mean, the subject is seen as a strategic subject that kind of strategically thinks uh, what to say or what not to say in order to be actively deceitful. Uh, but perhaps that's not exactly, you know, um, that's not the right picture because in other work you showed that. Uh, the subject is also put in a condition of not having all of the information that they need in order to know what to say. So I, I, I was wondering if, if you could elaborate a, li a little bit on, on this notion and, and on the similarities and differences that you see with Foucault's notion of, of uh, deceit, deceitful subject. Thanks. Yeah, so I mean, uh, just to, to, be, to be sure that I understood the question, uh, the possibility for uh, the asylum seeker to strategically play this confession. Exactly. And, yes. Yeah. And, and and the fact that they don't they they don't have all the information that they need in order to know what they are supposed to say, so they cannot like probably play the game as a perfectly you know as as subjects who perfectly know how to uh, confess in order to obtain the status that they want. Yeah, 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 and this is uh, is related, I guess, to what I was pointing to uh, in part uh, towards the end of the talk, right? Also, thanks to what you mean to the inspiration uh, from you uh, from last week. So, this the, the possibility to to engage in act of truth telling that are not uh, the one set by power, right? So that is not the moment when asylum seekers need to confront state authorities or non-state actors. Uh, in light of what is requested to them, right? As asylum seekers or because they are approached by Frontex, but in order, for instance, to um, uh, show unveil uh, border violence and state violence, this is one aspect. 
Uh, on the other aspect, how they are able to strategically play? Yes, of course. The end of those studies is um, is important to, of course, to highlight that there are uh, scholars who have uh, illustrated that. I mean, how, how asylum seekers strategically uh, engage with with this notion, these no, these categories, right? Because they are because they have been briefed sometimes, right, by NGOs or by activists about. Uh, the, what are the criteria according to which um, in that specific countries, there are more chances of getting asylum, right? So they, there is this, um, uh, this orchestration of the lie to you, to put it in finance term, uh, to convince um, the, the panel to get, uh, to get asylum. So there is definitely, it's not a linear or a top-down um, process, right? Of asking migrants to speak and just, uh, of course, is is uh, is absolutely played by migrants themselves, but uh, the the leeway uh, is uh, is I would say is always has always been very limited. But in this moment, is extremely is particularly extremely tough, right? To to get um, not only the refugee status but also other forms of protection. So the uh, the, the grounds for states to deny uh, uh, subsidiary protection, refugee status. Are, are huge, right? Because there are, I mean, there are new laws that are constantly invented precisely with this purpose of illegalizing uh, migrants. So I don't know if this is what you were pointing to. Yes, that's, that's, that's great. Uh, I was precisely thinking of, you know, the opening up of possibilities and where, where should we look uh, in order to be able to open up possibilities, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I think in terms of um, well, in my um, as I said, there are moments in which even if are are extremely sometimes like marginal and local, but there are is also thanks to this testimony provided by given by uh, migrants that it has been possible to reconstruct in detail uh, the violation of international law and human rights. Um, um, enforced by states, right, uh, on the part of NGOs and activists and scholars. Uh, and on the other is, of course, also the, the collective um, uh, forms of uh, um, speech that uh, sometimes migrants engage in in collective struggles, right? So when there is this um, more like blatant uh, attempt to um, uh, engage and to and to challenge uh, the border regime, so collective migrant struggles, not always are um, are I mean, are based on speech. Sometimes are silent. Sometimes are just based on actions. But there are all, there have been also extremely powerful uh, speech by migrant groups. It seems to foreground even more how in the asylum regime the uh, colonial legacy means that there are better and more effective tactics for taking up information in order to diagnose the tactics of counter conduct as you're describing. And so it seems like, I mean, the apparatus is so big now. It's so big, it's so advanced technologically, biometrically, um, confessionally. It seems like the, the apparatus is just on a different level, it seems, than the way in which Foucault is thinking about these mechanisms, especially in Elizabeth Lachère or Confessions of the Flesh where, it, it's a privilege to be able to be the subject who gets to speak the truth of themselves in order to announce themselves. And it's not right, I mean, I'm not saying it's just, but I think that that's part of the way in which subject formation is being described in a very cisgender male elite way that was you know, Foucault's own subject position. Not that he was limiting himself when thinking about ethics, but I think that is the perspective that he is adopting. And I think what I love so much about your talk, Martina, is that you're you're forcing us to think through the limitations of that very construction and the way in which confession in itself and the idea of who gets to be a self is at stake in the asylum regime. Yeah, I don't know if she's... No, are we collecting oh, questions or... Yeah. No, no, I don't, or am I supposed to... Respond? Oh, we have more uh, questions coming in and Jim, of course, is always uh, chime in. Uh, so one question from uh, Nicholas uh, Dejanova. If, as Fanon suggests, objectivity is merely one more weapon employed in the permanent war against the colonized, then 
Fanon juxtaposes truth. Truth, he says, is that which hurries on the breakup of the colonialist regime. Please reflect on this discrepant sense of the politics of truth between Fanon and Foucault. Well, uh, thanks, Nicolas, for the for the question and the comments. Um, yeah, is uh, that which hurries on the breakup of the colonialist regime? I, I think there are well, there are multiple levels. Is not is not as a, I think it's important to consider this. This is one of the way in which the, the truth, for, according to Fanon, it, seem, it seems to me. Is, a, is at stake in the space of the colony and also in the encounter between uh, the doctor and the subject from North Africa, from the North African, as he call him. Um, uh, so the, the, is a, this individual encounter in which that, in my opinion, um, that, that Fanon describes in his psychiatric writings, uh, the, there is another, uh, in my view, another, concept of truth which emerged through those writings that is not the same in the of the wretch of the earth so this impossibility uh, for for the for the colonized to um <clears throat> to, to tell the truth right uh, because it is not even contemplated in the regime of veridiction and the regime of truth established by the colonizer and then there is this um this asp this layer that should be i think um, articulated uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the layer that you says about that, and he also speaks about in the wretch of the earth, and that for me is also um, is also a moment of opening, uh, because if, if, as I was saying in the talk, so that there is this um, that he also speaks about um, well in other in other um, short writings about uh, the, the the radio that has been. Um, that has been uh, used by the Algerian people as a right as a as a, um, a vehicles for enforcing this kind of collective counter truth. Um, for me, this is a this is a moment where where Fanon shows that there is the possibility of of a collective counter truth, despite the fact that the colonial regime impose um, impose its own truth, but also obfuscate the truth of. Uh, at the same time of colonial violence. And however, Fanon points out to this, to this moment, these historical moments, political moments uh, of reappropriation and possibility of twisting this, this truth in terms of the collective truth of decolonization. Um, regarding the relationship between Foucault and Fanon, so having this in mind, um, Foucault and uh, Fanon uh, understanding of truth, um, yeah, I would say that uh, in, in Fanon, uh, uh, so the, the way in which he speaks about the truth is constantly related to uh, these specific sites and moment of that concern, uh, the, the, the possibility or the difficulty of the subjugation um, from the, the, the colonial um, domination, the colonial regime, that of course this is not. So our truth become um, a weapon on both sides um, this is described, I mean, uh, is, is, is described by, uh, of course, is at the core of uh, uh, Foucault's analysis, but this aspect of uh, the truth that occludes and uh, erase these histori historical moments of colonial domination is, a, a, is, not, uh, is not contemplated by Foucault, right? Beautiful. So, uh, Prasenji Vistas, if you would like to speak your question out loud, I think it's a good yeah, follow-up. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, uh, hello, hello, good evening, Nikki. And uh, uh, Martina, uh, I just wanted to point at uh, something about the constraints you know, of truth speaking on the part of the migrant. Uh, it looks to me when the migrant or asylum seeker is approaching the authority, to accept him or her, uh, the, the other side, that is the side of the government to which the migrant is seeking, is uh, putting up a truth machine before which uh, truth and lies are detected in a certain way. And that's a kind of a mode of policing and profiling and also creating a situation for the migrant in which any amount of truth that the migrant speaks or 
shows the courage to speak uh, is something, according to Foucault, would be a kind of a cynical truth, which is uh, not fully articulated and which is still in a process of incubation for itself, uh, which is, again, a certain kind of a uh, phenomenalization of uh, uh, the veiled truth of one's life uh, in a manner that the expressed truth is now under examination under the gaze of a truth machine. And this is a uh, complete um, uh, inability to speak the truth before a truth machine. And the migrant is suffering uh, irreparably because of this inability and because of this pressure of uh, an extraction that is happening, something like facing an interrogation. So therefore, uh, the truth is not actually being expressed. And there is an ambiguity or ambivalence about the truth of migrants life there. In such a situation, the migrant is disempowered, desubjectivated, and also erased in a certain way. Um, now, what is the way out of such a situation? Can we think of something like an ethics of hospitality, as uh, probably Derrida would be talking about? Uh, is there something parallel to that in Foucault as well? I would like to know that, yeah. Thank you. Can you just repeat the last bit so that if there is something of in terms of hospitality? Uh, ethics of hospitality, unreserved mm -hmm. hospitality that Derrida talks of, mm -hmm. where this truth machine is removed. While uh, mm -hmm. at the checkpoint in another country, another state, the stateless faces uh, an inhospitable condition. Now, whether Foucault would articulate it, uh, something like an ethics of hospitality in order to accept, recognize the difficulty of speaking the truth before a truth machine from which the asylum seeker is seeking asylum. Well, uh, I don't know what Foucault would say about the ethics of hospitality. Um, for me, it, well, is um, is a contested term in the sense that hospitality presupposes that there is a country that when there is this ambivalence of the notion of hospitality that reproposes a sort of um, I mean, idea that uh, this war, that we accept this uh, containerization of the world so that we are waiting for asylum seekers from elsewhere and we should either accept or set the condition for accepting them and hosting them right so i don't know if foucault would be sympathetic to the to an ethics of hospitality um, as, a, as a concept to counter the machine of truth. But um, so in my, in my view, I don't know if machine of, I, I like this expression, but at the same time, um, I don't know if the point is uh, the truth that is, um, so in this sense, I think that we, that the parallel with Fanon cannot be fully mobilized. So it is not like, the truth of colonization, the, the, the truth that colonial regime, colonial domination imposed, right? And by erasing colonial violence uh, against the truth of the colonized. So I, I wouldn't uh, speak in this like binary and uh, Manichaean terms as Fanon himself defined it, uh, in the sense that um, even without mobilizing uh, truth, um, there are more like, more like banal or uh, less noble um, uh, way through which mechanism, through which states uh, manage to um, preventively deny uh, asylum, I mean, uh, the access to the asylum procedure, which are mainly administrative measure and laws and policies. So the moment in which there is this, this clash, this confrontation uh, between the truth of asylum seeker and their story, uh, and in which the asylum seeker is, de is declared as um, a liar is only one, right? Uh, so the there is this, definitely this machine of criminalization that only in part is predicated in my view on truth, right? There is a, the, is, is not, is not only true like truth that, that, that asylum seekers are um, illegalized uh, and this is the reason why I prefer to insist more on this mechanism of knowledge extraction and at the same time on this constant racialization and criminalization of asylum seekers. So the, the lack of credibility is a key component and is 
as tangible effects for the migrants because if uh, the, the asylum application is considered as like um, not grounded or unfunded, the person is denied, right? Is rejected. But but there are many other ways through which people are even before that moment illegalized or that after are criminalized and illegalized again. Um, so I wouldn't narrow down everything. I mean, I wouldn't narrow down the function of the border regime to a machine of truth. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Do yeah, uh, we have uh, time for one more or unless Jim would like to uh, take up the reins? Actually, uh, just uh, to thank you, Martina, uh, for bringing the issue of confession uh, and its relation to uh, regimes of veridiction and jurisdiction, indeed, into our present and through its at least partial secularization. I think it's an extremely important a uh, contribution to our conference and something we're all going to need to be reflecting about uh, in reflecting again about Foucault's engagement with Christianity, Christianity with confession, with uh, the significantly truncated uh, comments one might have hoped would be less uh, truncated in the first volume of the history of sexuality about the relationship between the Christian past and its secularization into a, a psychiatric, psychological, uh, sexological present. In any event, uh, just thank you. No question, just thanks. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, so maybe we'll just see the last question then from David Chavez that I think is a, a really lovely, um, well, no, just horrifying. So we have an entire affective economy that we're kind of working through in the background of fear. And uh, David asks, do you have any thoughts or analysis on the relationship between exhaustive verbalization and the credible fear proceedings of unaccompanied minors in particular? Do refugee children present a more credible testimony confession or are they the children of the colonized bundled under the same epistemological subjugation? Many refugees bear the marks of violence on their very bodies. What role does embodied testimony play in the credible fear proceedings of the asylum seeker? My work, David, is rooted in the particular border dynamics along the US-Mexico border. Thanks a lot for the question. Well, I have no expertise on minors, so I'm not definitely the best person to address this question. But what I can say, I mean, I, I fully agree with your, I think is a super important question because indeed, uh, as you also say, so this assessment of the body, right, of the minors, uh, in order to prove that they are minors, so that independently of what they say, um, and also how this, uh, however, this test um, on the, about their age, uh, and, and I mean, I know that is a critical point about the US-Mexico borders, but also in Europe, right? So that there are all these, like, um, at the moment, um, Con contested um, debates between state authorities and NGOs about minors who are denied uh, the access, have been denied the access to the asylum procedure and who have been pushed back, for instance, from France to Italy, even if they are minors. So in principle, they couldn't. Uh, they, they, the states, this France is not allowed to be presented because they're minors, so they should be um, allowed to, uh, to, to stay, to, to enter France. And, and so the way in which, and this part, there is a, a real politics of cheating on the part of the, the state, state authorities who um, uh, uh, declare that the person is not a minor, even if this is the case. Uh, by, um, in, so th there is this declaration based on, so they completely disregard any proof of evidence, right? Of, or they try to, um, to alter the result of the test. Um, and I don't know at the US-Mexico border, but what I mean, the, the current battle uh, in Europe is also about the impossibility for the minors to, to speak and to declare uh, their willingness of claiming asylum. So they are, there is this preventive removal. Um, uh, they are not allowed to, 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 
not even to declare that they are minors and this uh, supplement of like this bodily truth right uh, of their age uh, is often simply disregarded or as I said altered so there is yeah this uh, politics of lying on the part of the state Well, thank you so much. Is there anything that you would like to have us know or keep in mind as we consider these, these issues of I mean, the refugee crisis and um, asylum seekers more broadly in relation to Go or whatever it is that you wish to leave us with today? That, oh, do you have any, uh, any closing hortatory <laughs> remarks? What can we do, Martina? <laughs> what can we do? Um, well, the question. Um, well, I think that the, the, the solution cannot be found in, uh, yeah, as I said, I mean, I think that the, the, the previous discussion, right, the question about the truth machine is for me quite in, an interesting point for, for saying we, we cannot narrow the battle to the moment of when, when migrants are asked to speak because of the, the rule are legal and uh, impartially also illegal architecture of, of the border regime so that preventively the amper people from reaching Europe or uh, uh, by legalizing uh, migrants as soon as they they arrive so this is not this this aspect that I've just shown is not I just want to clarify is not necessarily the the core uh, of the battle but definitely helps in looking at uh, how these power dynamics um, that, and violence, border violence, um, that migrants are exposed to are not limited, circumscribed to the moments when migrants are um, uh, beaten by the police or pushed back or uh, left to die at sea, but also to this uh, forced um, uh, uh, process of knowledge extraction that have like also direct consequence uh, on them. And I think that, yeah, this, at, the, at the same time, it's always important to reflect on these moments of opening so that at, anyway, uh, migrants not only continue to, to arrive in Europe, but also that um, precisely also based on these violent politics of knowledge and extractive politics of knowledge, is also, there is always the leeway for countering. So for uh, and envisaging uh, non-extractive, in my opinion, forms of knowledge production that are critique of uh, border violence. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> really remarkable talk today. And I hope that we as scholars, cultural producers, whoever and wherever can join this kind of um, epistemic shifting in order to better curb the injustices. Indeed. Thank you, Martina. 